State Library of Victoria. My name is Astrid Edwards, and I'm so excited that the State Library of Victoria is reopening tomorrow. However, I am still at home uh, in the suburbs of Melbourne, and I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners on whose land I live and work. I would like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, and I would like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. As I said, my name is Astrid Edwards, and today I get to speak to the wonderful Maxine Beniba Clark. Maxine, welcome. Thanks, Astrid. <laughs> now, I get extremely excited, thrilled, in fact, to talk to you. I think, uh, with no hint of a lie, that you are some kind of creative genius. We are about the same age, and I think that you are phenomenal. I thought about doing a traditional writer type intro for you, but instead, I'm going to hold up this phenomenal stack of books that I have of yours. You have published everything from poetry to memoir to award-winning, well, everything kind of is award-winning, short stories, uh, illustrated books. You are working on an adaptation of your uh, memoir, Maxine. Thank you for spending time with me and those watching today. But of course, Congratulations on when we say Black Lives Matter. Thank you. I'm uh, so excited about it coming out next week. So for those watching us, uh, when we say Black Lives Matter is Maxine's fourth picture book. It will be published in Australia next week. Maxine, introduce us to your fourth picture book. <laughs> so when we say Black Lives Matter is um, a picture book that, as it sounds really, is a book for children about the value of black lives. Um, it's something that I kind of conceptualized. I live in Melbourne, so it was during the first lockdown that we had for the for COVID-19 in Melbourne. And just watching the Black Lives Matter movement um, roll out across the world, um, come together as it has done many times before, but really on a global level this time. And yeah, the idea that children really should have, have something that's both age appropriate and honest and joyous to explain to them what this movement means. So here is my copy, it just arrived. This is a beautiful book and I mean that in terms of the words but you have written, but I also mean the physicality of the book and, and the art. So not only did you write this book, but you have illustrated it as well. So the second, this is your second children's book that you have both written and illustrated. And I do want to talk to you about both of those elements. But first, let's stick with the subject matter. As you said, you know, 2020 is the year that Black Lives Matter reach the mainstream international media. But Black Lives Matter is not a new idea. It is not a new movement. It means different things to different people. How did you take such a meaningful yet huge three words and articulate to three-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I suppose it was seeing this movement unfold, you know, across the world, um, particularly in Australia, you know, where Black Lives Matter first and foremost really is a comment on the fact that sovereignty here has not been ceded. Um, and, I, and looking at that idea that um, this is really a movement that has been put together by the three founders, three African-American women, um, Opal, Alicia and Patrice, who conceptualize this as something that could be a grassroots movement in different places so that you would take really the shell that was the Black Lives Matter movement and it would actually be transportable and able to be um, formed as a movement by communities at the grassroots level. And so that was really was my starting point was how do I try and articulate this without really being specific? So thinking about what does black joy mean? What does black love mean? Um, why are those three words so important? And so looking at some of the I suppose, historical inequities um, in terms of blackness across the world and trying to, I suppose, articulate them in a way that's general, but that signals to children who've experienced 
um, discrimination because of the color of their skin, that they can also try and see themselves in it. So the description from Hachette, your publisher says it's, you know, for three years and up, but I've now read the book a few times and I am definitely giving it to my six and nine-year-old nieces. It's a concept that adults don't necessarily engage with well. Who did you think was your end reader? Who did you want to be your end reader? Were you thinking of the child? Were you thinking of the parents? I think with my picture books, I'm really interested in picture books that cut across ages. I mean, I love buying picture books myself. Um, so I kind of have this idea. And really, I mean, parents are the people who first engage with picture books. You know, they're the ones who are in the bookstores with their kids. And I love it when I, you know, my kids are uh, 14 and 10 now, so they're past picture book age. But when I would buy something that I would be able to learn from, enjoy visually and engage with. So I definitely had that in mind. And I had in mind, I suppose, creating a multi-layered text. So really, the more you know about the world, the more you're going to get out of this book. Um, so there's some images, for example, of, um, you know, police tape, um, you know, a mother and a child kind of bending down beneath some police tape, which obviously a three-year-old is not going to imagine that this is potentially the scene of a slaying. But if you're reading that as a parent or if you're looking at as a, you know, budding picture book artist or as an adult, then you're going to get an, another layer. So I suppose I was interested in taking that simple text and, and adding illustrations that would expand the possibilities. This is a strange question, Maxine. So put me in my place if, um, uh, if needed. But as I was thinking about you writing this book and I've asked you before, um, you know, what, what are your children's opinions of your book? But is this a conversation that you had with your children? And was there a book around for you to facilitate that conversation? I mean, I think it's, it's I've had, I mean, my children saw this book unfold. So I work, you know, at home. Um, so, and I don't stop work kind of, you know, at 3.30 when the kids come in. So it was more, I started working on it and they would come home and say, oh, what are you working on? And what's this drawing? And, you know, and I'd kind of explain what I was doing. And I suppose we had various conversations in that sense as I was making the work. I think that, you know, when you're a child of colour, when you have black parents, it's not so much you know, this is like a, a running conversation that happens throughout their whole lives. So it's not that this book, the, the idea for this book arrived and all of a sudden there were discussions about it. It was kind of more, a, this is why I'm making this book at this point in time, as opposed to talking about the broader concept of Black Lives Matter. So let's talk about you making this book, publishing this book, you know, at this point in time. Obviously there is the international uh, backdrop um, and the media uh, and the politics. But it's extraordinary to have an idea and get it up and published in the same year. So that is just a work of exceptional diligence and, I don't know, luck and creativity. But how did you get this work out before Christmas in 2020? <laughs> well, I think, you know, I sent the text to my publisher um, and said, look, this is a text that I've just written. It's to articulate, you know, the notion of Black value and the value of Black lives to children. I'd love to turn it into a picture book. And they kind of read it and immediately said, yes, we want to put this out and we want to put it out as soon as possible. Um, you know, it's not a text that needs to wait. And I think there are a couple of books I've done that with before, simply because of um, outside factors um, for example, I think my poetry collection, Carrying the World, we put together in six weeks or something, but it was kind of a collected works. Um, and so, yeah, I worked on this. It was almost like a frenzy. You know, it was during the first lockdown and a lot of my other, I had a lot of school visits planned because I've got to work on the curriculum in Victoria and all of those fell away because all of a sudden it was lockdown. And so really that created space to intensively work on a project. And there were a lot of question marks as to, I think when publishers make a decision to put a work out, you know, they kind of acquire the, the work and then they immediately start scheduling it, start contacting bookstores. 
And so I did, there was that, um, I suppose, pressure cooker situation where I thought I may not, what if I don't get this done? <laughs> you know, they've already put the release date out. What if I don't get it finished? Um, but I think it was a book that had to be made that way. There was a real urgency, I suppose, about the way I was illustrating it. Do you work well in that kind of pressure cooker environment or is it just that you have to get it done? I do. I do. I think I do because um, I, you know, when I, when my writing first started taking off in the sense of being published by a commercial publisher, I had very small kids and, you know, I was a single parent. So I was writing while my kids were doing swimming lessons. I was writing while dinner was cooking. I was, it really was writing in those small moments I got. And so I think that has almost just become by default the way that I work, mm -hmm. even though I have a little bit more time now that the kids are over to create. So, you know, I find it difficult to find a word to adequately describe your craft and the, the art that you create. And I include all of your, your words in that broad term of art. How much did your spoken word and, and your short form fiction contribute to your, you know, um, the fact that you have four picture books out there. It's a different age group, but you cross so many different genres, so many different ages. I'm really interested in that creative blend. Yeah, I think my instinct is to go with short form, you know, and when I was creating spoken word, which is the way I first really started out creating my work years ago, you know, 15, 20 years ago, um, I was doing poetry slam. So, you know, fitting that poem into two minutes of time and performing it live for an audience. And I think that that really, I suppose, honed that skill of the short form. Um, all of my picture books are poems. So when we say Black Lives Matter, Wide Big World, Fashionista and the Patchwork Bike, if you pulled out the text, they could work as, I suppose, children's poems. And so I think that does contribute to you know, even though I've only written four picture books, I guess my training in a sense of being a poet is in creating a narrative in very few words. So Maxine, you just said only four picture books and I feel like I need to just kind of say there is nothing only about that. You've yeah. written and published four, two of which you illustrated yourself, which, you know, is, um, I don't have the words, I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about your illustrations. So as I said before, this is a physically beautiful book, right? It is a pleasure to pick up and to leaf through. Mm -hmm. I am not an artist. I'm not a visual artist. And I fear I don't have the right words to ask you an adequate question here. But how did you find the visual expression of, you know, the poem for a child that you have essentially written here? I think it was um, thinking about the concept of black history, black life, black love and the Black Lives Matter movement and what kind of colours speak to me, what kind of um, images and um, I guess trying to bring that history to the illustrations of a kid's book. So it's illustrated on, um, it doesn't have a white background, it has like, um, kind of different different color backgrounds for each page. I don't know if people can see that. Yeah. Um, and so the, the palette that I used was almost a, a 1960s palette. So, you know, the, think of like homes that were decorated in the 1960s or colors people were wearing. They were kind of these rich browns paired with almost jewel tones, like emeralds and rubies and stuff like that. And so partly it was thinking about what palette um, am I going to use that really pays homage to um, really the civil rights movement of the, of the 60s. Uh, because of course, Black Lives Matter has a whole history of movements behind it. Even in Australia, there's a strong history of black resistance with Charlie Perkins and the Freedom Rides and the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. So it was partly using those kind of, that 60s color palette and then I started thinking about black churches as a place of um, as a place of prayer and as a place of gathering, but also this idea that black churches are also a place of pain and sorrow. You know, there were funerals are held, 
You have things like the Birmingham church bombings in Alabama, um, where you know four young African American girls died, and the Emmanuel Episcopal Church bombings more recently. Um, so these real acts of, I guess, white supremacy that happen in churches. And so um, some of the images in here are um, they have church windows in the background, and through the church windows you see kind of you know this man in chains, so the legacy of slavery, and through this one you have you know, someone in the 60s with that big Afro of the civil rights movement and the, the end notes as well kind of use that stained glass technique of, of fracturing the images. And so it was really about, I suppose, um, trying to encapsulate lots of civil rights movements in those images without actually referring to them in the text. I have a completely leading question for you now, but as you, as you held up, and showed us some of the images. I know uh, kids are already studying your written word, you know, in the HSE and and, and BCE this um, this year. Do you think you'll ever be studied as a visual artist? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, it blows my mind that that's a possibility because this is the second book that I've illustrated. You know, when I was at university studying, I did dabbled in in visual arts. Um, but it really has been a, a self-development as an illustrator. You know, it's something that I decided I wanted to illustrate and kind of developed a style. So it blows my mind that that could be a possibility. <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> Just for those watching, this is Fashionista, which is the other book that you illustrated yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, fashion your feelings, work it, wear it, believe it. <laughs> It is also gorgeous, although although we will uh, stick with talking about when we say Black Lives Matter for the moment. I'm interested in, because this is a complete creation of you, you felt it, you had the idea, you illustrated it, you wrote it. Like it, it's all Maxine Beneva Clark. How did you even do like the typesetting? It's different on every page. Sometimes it flows. I mean, that is also sometimes, you know, elsewhere in the publishing department. Was that in your control this time as well? No, it was, I mean, the typesetting is always, for my picture books, is always a bit of a collaboration. So the designer does it in-house mm -hmm. and there was a different designer for the typesetting in, um, it's the same designer as I had for Wide Big World, I believe, but different from Fashionista. And so the designer did an initial text, uh, which was just kind of, these are the, I mean, there was even conversation in the beginning of these are the three fonts we're looking at, you know, which one do you think works? And I think right up until we pressed print, there was some switching around of colours um, to kind of, I guess I was trying to make the text as much a part of the artwork as possible. So things like, you know, could you make one word the same colour as the pants on the opposite page? Or, you know, could you tone back the white a little bit? So I'm sure the text designer, I was probably a nightmare because it's all of a sudden I think when you write the book, and you've illustrated the book and all of a sudden someone else has their artistic hand in it you're kind of going no I want you know that's not what I was envisioning that said there are some absolutely beautiful text layout there um, that I never would have thought of um, so let me try and find an example so as you said this um you know, kind of bouncy text for a page which is about dancing uh, down the street. And there's another, this page here, um, where the word shadows kind of has this, um, I don't know how what how well a job I'm doing showing people, but on the purple page, <laughs> the word shadows has this kind of um, shadow underneath it on the ground. And so, yeah, it was a beautiful collaboration between the designer and kind of me seeing things that I never would have envisaged myself and feed us feeding back and forth. Often when I'm, you know, reading with, um, you know, young kids, family members, it's fascinating to see when they try to touch the book and, you know, what, and often, you know, there are those gimmicks where, you know, it feels different or whatever, but I can imagine children wanting to touch and interact with this book, which I think just means they're going to love it and immerse themselves in the world that you have built for them more. 
Yeah, I really love that. Um, I guess I draw gravitate towards children's books where you feel like you just want to reach out and touch the pages. I think that's the wonder of picture books. I have a question. Did the the illustrations, did the the art that accompanies your text, did it ever cause you to change the words? Like, did you ever kind of come to a different part of the story and have to go back and change the words? No, not not with this book. Um, definitely with Fashionista, uh, there were moments where I thought, oh, this doesn't quite fit. But with this one, the text, uh, the text, it was written kind of as a complete poem that could potentially sit on its own and I didn't want to make any tweaks to it. Um, I think there were maybe one or two words that I changed, but that didn't have to do with the artwork. But there were definitely artworks that didn't or illustrations that didn't go in the book because I did them thinking, oh, they'll go with this particular line in the book and then they just didn't sit right or perhaps they weren't adding anything to the text. Um, there wasn't that kind of conversation between the words and the text. So there were definitely a lot of outtakes to try and match each particular line with the best version of the artwork that it could be. I know you have so many projects that you are working on, most of them for adults, but what are your future plans for kids' books? Um, I love making picture books. And I think, you know, it's this strange thing that when you make work for adults, you know, you are often looked down upon when you suddenly start producing picture books because there's this feeling that picture books are easy to write and you only need 200 to 300 words and anyone can do it. Um, but it is actually, I find it more difficult to write a picture book that I'm happy with a few years later than I do to write, you know, a short fiction book or a memoir or something that I'm still happy with. Um, and I think kids are brutal. <laughs> you know, they're incredible. And when they love something, then they'll, they'll let you know. But there is nothing like making a piece of work and handing it to a kid and they just like, you yeah, know, this is boring and chuck it away. <laughs> you know, they're very hard to please. But it, so I like that challenge, you know, this idea that, um, and I think the idea that you can be part of the narrative of a child's life from such an early age is really appealing to me. Um, so I have thought about creating work and I have written one book that's kind of an early chapter book for older kids, but um, I have thought about creating work for older kids, but um, who knows? Definitely more picture books. Well, I'm looking forward to more picture books, but I would also just like to say for the public record that I hope you write chapter books. I hope you write middle grade. I hope you write YA. And then there can be the whole Maxine Bonnie Clark experience from when you were three, uh, <laughs> lifelong. I think that I would like this um, for the future of Australia. <laughs> Set them up early. And <laughs> Set them up early. <laughs> so when we say Black Lives Matter is obviously um, one of, it talks about one of the major things that has happened in 2020 and of all of the things that 2020 will be remembered for, Black Lives Matter will be one of them. Will this go elsewhere? Will this be published outside of Australia? Yes, it will. <laughs> I can't name the publishers yet because they haven't announced it, but um, it will be published in the UK in March next year and it will be published in the US in September next year, which is, it will be the first um, UK picture book I've had. So The Hate Race, My Memoir and Foreign Soil have been published in the UK. So, yeah, it's really exciting. Um, and I think, you know, I... When I was writing it, I suppose I was trying to envisage a book that would have many applications across the world and just start dialogues. And so, yeah, it's really beautiful that I know that this is going to be out in three territories in the world where it's really needed. Congratulations are in order. That is an amazing achievement for anyone, particularly an Australian writer, because our market is so much smaller than, you know, the UK and the American market. Um, and again, for the public record, I hope you make a huge amount of money, Maxine, in the American <laughs> market. Uh, just, just saying. Um, now, you mentioned before that, you know, your other works are studied uh, in, you know, the final year of high school. Mm -hmm. Am I correct in thinking that exam is taking place this week? 
Yeah, I think today the exam for foreign soil, my short fiction collection. So it's the third year that it's been on the VCE curriculum, which has been a really experience as a writer to see young people studying your book. Um, it's just, I think, a lot. Of, some writers don't like it. You know, they feel that they, they didn't write their books to be read in that particular way. But I think for me, having grown up studying Jane Austen and Shakespeare and, and to all of a sudden have 17, 18 year olds who, who are, you know, reading my work in that way, it's, it's um, I never thought it would happen particularly not in Australia. So yeah, it's incredible. I understand why some writers don't want that to happen. Uh, you know, it's not fun when, you know, a 17 year old is on social media saying they hate your work, mm -hmm. but it is a beautiful thing that the Australian curriculum is changing. Mm. This is a strange question, I guess, um, but do you think you know, is that the right book that's on the curriculum? Would you have thought something else would make it to the curriculum out of all of your works? Um, I was surprised. Um, so you get notified, you know, my publishers emailed me and said they've called for, I think it's 20 copies or something, the curriculum board. And then we didn't hear anything for about six months. And I think the next year rolled around and all of a sudden I was getting teachers saying, can you come and talk to my class because your book's on the VC curriculum. And so it just kind of happened behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, it's a book with, you know, 11 short stories set in all different places around the world. The majority of characters are black African diaspora characters. Um, it deals with some difficult themes, you know, things like domestic violence, um, you know, racial disparities. There's a story set in Villawood Detention Centre. Um, and so I suppose in my mind when I was writing, I was writing it for adults, but then these are young adults and the conversations that I'm having with them, you know, I think, you know, yes, yes, you do sometimes get hate mail or kids sending you things saying, I hate your book, we were made to read it. And I kind of think, you know, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm now George Orwell, you know. <laughs> But um, yeah, I didn't think I didn't think it would. Um, the hate race is actually going on the syllabus. Um, it was supposed to go on next year when foreign soil came off for general English, but because of um, the pandemic, they've kind of kept the list for another year, so it'll be twenty twenty two. And I think that has surprised me as well because I think, it, you know, again, it's a very difficult book to engage with. But then, when you think of Hamlet, when you think of Romeo and Juliet, and you know, books that we're reading about, your kids are reading about wars or utopias and anti-utopias or suicide or, um, you know, does it make this book more difficult because they're contemporary issues or does it just make it more, you know, more engaging? Um, it is a good question. You just happen to list a whole pile of books that I studied in my final year of school, <laughs> Hamlet, George Orwell's 1984, and... I can't think, as an adult, I can't think of an argument that they are potentially less traumatizing than your, your work. It's just, a, I think it's a cultural bias that we have. For those listening, <laughs> here are Maxine's books. And if you don't have a copy on your shelves, honestly, this is a contribution to all of the people in your life. I think that you're a wonderful, wonderful artist, Maxine. When you have when you have works on the curriculum and you know you do go and talk to uh, kids of all ages, you are on the schools program, what's the best thing a kid has ever said to you about your work? Wow. One kid, um, I was doing workshops one year at the Immigration Museum and um, there was a kid who said, Miss, which was very strange, no one's ever called me Miss before. <laughs> he said, Miss, your book is the only book I've ever finished reading. <laughs> And that to me, you know, when it was a child who's not a reader who got through to the end of the book. Um, there was also a Somali Australian kid whose teacher told me that he missed the bus stop to school because he was reading a story of mine in foreign soil, Harlem Jones, which is about a young black teenager in the middle of the Tottenham riots in, in 2011. And so just that, I suppose that engagement's from kids who would not necessarily 
read your work, you know, aren't interested in literature. Of course, it's really great when you get whole classes of kids who are super into books and, you know, love your work. But I think it's those moments of connection with young people that um, that maybe haven't had that kind of a connection before. Yeah, you're changing people's lives, Maxine. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd go that far, <laughs> but engaging with their lives is enough, I think. <laughs> I am very happy to go, th go that far in public based on your work. Um, thank you very much for coming to Afternoon Tea and Talk with the State Library of Victoria, Maxine. For those listening, I utterly, utterly recommend this, uh, when we say Black Lives Matter, as part of your Christmas shopping list or, or just your shopping list in general. Um, and also a portion of the sales of the book will go to the Indigenous Literary Foundation. So thank you for joining me. Afternoon Tea and Talk will be back in two weeks time. Our next guest will be Tara June Winch and she will be joining us all the way from France. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Astrid. It's always a pleasure to talk to you.